David, we should have stand still on some of our major highways. We'll have a lot of hazardous waste for the whole of right? So how many of you feel you're pretty busy in your life? Does anyone not feel they're busy? I mean, as a society, right, we're pretty busy people. We have jobs, we have school, we have activities, sports, ballet, volunteering, friends and family. We're pretty enmeshed in our society. I know I am. I mean, it's gotten so bad that when my mom wants to go to lunch with me, she calls my secretary to schedule it. That's not good. So you can imagine that people were relatively shocked when I announced that I was going to be taking 2013 and taking my family and going to Sydney, Australia for a year. This was highly unusual. It's not something that I do. The most common question that we are asked about this is, why did you do this? How the hell did you do this? And when we came back, it was, so what was it like? Well, it's interesting, you know, sabbaticals or time off are becoming more and more common. In the United States, up to 24% of employers offer some sort of sabbatical. It's pretty interesting. I didn't know that. But when you look at why people do sabbaticals, there's all types of different reasons. Lots of different reasons people have to take time off. And they're all good. But when we focus on why I took a year off, I need to get a little philosophical on you, a little philosophical perspective. I need to talk to you about my father, who I admire very much. You see, my father always ingrained in us growing up that it's important to set your sights on a goal. Set a vision. Work hard. And make sure you're focused on point B and work hard to achieve point B. There's no substitute for hard work. So in 2012, I was 41 years old, and I would take in his advice. I went to school. I worked my ass off. I was doing what I needed to do. I had a good job. had a good family. I had what I thought a good life-work balance. I had it figured out. But as many of you know, life sometimes throws us a curveball. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, what was your curveball? The truth is, I was lucky I didn't have a curveball. But during my day job, I'm a cancer surgeon. And these people do have curveballs. And I look people in the eye every day who are facing curveballs. I hear questions from them, how long do I have? Will I suffer? I hear a lot about regret. I regret things I didn't do. I regret there are things that I should have done. You see, I can help them with their cancer. I can use the latest innovations, the greatest technologies available. And usually we win. I can offer them hope, because hope is important. But one thing I don't have any technology for is their regret. People fear cancer, and I get it. People fear cancer. I've come to fear regret. Things that I hear from my patients every day. I wish I would have, it sucks getting old. Yesterday, and I kid you not, yesterday, I'm out living a little bit, but yesterday, a patient said to me as I was leaving the office, boy, it sucks getting old. I used to run, I was eat healthy, I've done everything right, but my knees hurt, my back hurts, I can't do what I used to do. I'm listening. They tell me, if I could do it all over again, I would do things differently. So here's the deal. I believe that not everyone needs to wait for their curveball. I believe that not everybody needs to touch the stove to know it's hot. You see, I think there's two types of people. One type of person's like my brother Todd. Now Todd's a brilliant pediatric surgeon. But growing up, Todd, despite many warnings, was the kid who needed to touch the stove to know it's hot. And that may be OK. Maybe it's actually a good thing. Who am I to judge? But I was a kid in the corner who would watch my little brother Todd touch the stove <laughs> and deduce from his reaction that, in fact, the stove was hot. <laughs> now, folks, I call that free advice. <laughs> you see, it's these perspectives on life 
that explain why. Why do I take my family and take a year and go to Sydney, Australia? You see, I'm listening to the free advice of my patients. I'm listening to the free advice of the people around us who've had life experiences. I'm hearing what they're telling me. I'm hearing what they're telling us. What they're saying is, don't wait only to live life when you retire. Do things differently now. Don't wait for your curveball. Don't live with regret. So how about how? Hopefully I've convinced you, for me, why. But how about how? Well, for that, I totally blame my wife. You see, my wife, Monica, has been working on me for years to take a two-week vacation. Two-week vacation. Now, let me tell you, I don't take two-week vacations. I'm busy. People count on me. I've got a job. I can't take a two-week vacation. But at some point, in a point of weakness, I somehow agreed to take a two-week vacation. And here's the trouble. It was fantastic. She was absolutely right. Don't tell her I said that. I don't like to admit that out loud too often, but she was right. I relaxed. I didn't feel like I was in a hurry to relax. I had a great time with my kids and the family. We, I actually unwound. I didn't check my email much. But I really felt rejuvenated. And when I went back to work, I was ready. I really felt like I had a vacation. It was a big difference. And I also found out that when I got back to work, they did fine without me. So the next year, the next year we were, I was convinced. I was all in. We were ready to plan our next year's vacation. And we were sitting around talking as a family. What should we do? There were so many opportunities. What can we do together? And I jokingly said, jokingly said, there's so much to do. We need a year to do it all. My teenage children quickly called my bluff <laughs> and said, that would be awesome. We should do it. Let's go. That would be so great. They were excited. I quickly retreated and said, guys, I agree. That would be so cool. But let me explain. I got responsibilities. I have a job. I got to like pay for the shoes on your feet. I can't do that. That's things that other people do. It's not in the cards for me. It's not in the cards for us. And my son, Eric, who was 13 at the time, asked a very impactful question. Why not? And I began, at first, to just respond with the same, well, I work and I can't do it. But I stopped. And I began to ponder his question. And I began to consider the track of life that I was on at that point in time. Head down, working like hell to get from point A to point B. I began to consider my patient's free advice. I also began to consider my father-in-law. You see, my father-in-law was a wonderful man, smart man, special. I loved him to death. And in 1998, he was diagnosed with cancer, and he, told, he was told he had three months to live. We got 13 years out of him due to his persistence. But even before he was diagnosed, he had a theory on life. And it was very complimentary to my father's, because he agreed that we should set goals. He agreed that we should set a vision and work towards that goal. The difference is he thought we should keep our head up. He thought we should take detours. Because he believed that the journey from point A to point B was just as important as reaching point B. This is how he lived his life. This is what he taught others. And this is what he taught me. So in thinking about this, and thinking about Eric's question, why not? I realized I don't want to wait for my curveball. I don't need to touch the stove to know it's hot. I don't want to wait for bad news to decide what's important to me. I was going to listen to the free advice I had been given, no regrets. So I began in my brain, because I couldn't tell anyone that I was thinking these crazy thoughts, but I began in my brain thinking about, instead of why I can't do it, I made myself think about, how can I make this happen? And how would it impact my children, 
their school, their friends, our family, my work, my community obligations. It seemed way overwhelming. The worst was, how was I going to break the news to my 95-year-old grandmother? It seemed like one of those knots that you can't untie. It just seemed like it wasn't doable. But then I remembered one of my father's words of wisdom, fatherism as we call it. And when I was in medical school and I would be presented with huge amount of material that I had not memorized that seemed insurmountable, I'd say, Dad, I can't do this. How do people do this? He said, Lee, just imagine you were given an elephant and they told you you have to eat the elephant. How would you start eating it? One bite at a time. So that's what we did. One bite at a time. We started approaching this thing that seemed impossible. This isn't me. So we started with money. We hadn't planned to take a year off, so we didn't put money away for this. So how can we do this? So we met with our first financial planner and we said, look, what do you think of this idea? We want to take a year off. Can we do this? And he said it was a really bad idea. <laughs> so we found another financial planner. <laughs> and we said, this is something we really want to do. Can you work with us to just give us an idea of what it would take if we were able to, if we could do this? And so we figured out, we went through our expenses and we sat down and we figured out, well, I could sell my cars, we could rent our house, I could lose a little bit from my savings, and if I got a job in Australia and you made this amount of money, you could do it. But we couldn't be financially responsible because I've got a family. I have to provide for them. I'm not willing to be financially responsible. So he said, if you do this, you could do it without being financially responsible. And that was important to us. And that was huge. That was an important first step because that gave us a target. Whether we could do it or not at that point, we didn't know. But at least we had a target to work towards. What about my job? I had a good job. I liked my job. I didn't want to lose my job. So I called HR. I didn't even know what HR did, but I called HR and I said, <laughs> I heard about these things called sabbaticals. How do I sign up? And he said, no, no, we don't have sabbaticals. And I was like, ugh, it's a block. But they said, but, as I was hanging up, we do have leave of leaves of absence. And you can do it for 12 months, bingo. But I was worried. Because again, I didn't want to be irresponsible. Again, I have to provide for my family. So what if my job wasn't there for me when I came back, even though they said it would, what if it wasn't? So I created two backup plans. I had a lot of conversations with different people and I created two backup jobs just in case. What about my career? I'm an academic physician, meaning I write papers, I do research. Is this gonna hurt my career? Is this career suicide? So I talked to two mentors and I said, what do you think? And they said, Go for it. It won't hurt your career. I wish I would have done it myself. So after many phone calls and emails, and you can imagine how many conversations, I was able to find a job in Australia that would provide me that level that I needed to hit to make it work. What about my kid's school? Again, not willing to compromise, not negotiable, won't compromise their education. Talk to their teachers, talk to their counselors, talk to their college counselors. What do you think? Absolutely, won't hurt them, it'll be good for them. So again, after many phone calls and emails and conversations, we found a school we could enroll them in. Things looked like they were working out. It wasn't hard, it was just a lot of work. And I think that's what prevents people from doing it, is it's just a lot of work. But I still wasn't ready, because something was holding me back, and I needed something to push me over the edge. And sometimes when you want some advice, you look for the advice you want to hear. So I went to a TED Talk, actually, by Stefan Segmeister, called The Power of Time Off. And he gave a really great idea. He said, you know, most people in their careers, they train for about 25 years. They study, they train, they develop skills. And then they work for about 40 years while they're planning and thinking about and dreaming about their next subsequent 15 plus years for retirement. This model seems to be broken because who knows what kind of condition we're gonna be in when we reach our retirement. Are we gonna be healthy? Are we gonna be here? Where will our families be? What kind of appetite will we have for adventure? didn't seem right. So he said, what if we just borrow some years from our retirement and disperse them throughout our working years? Brilliant. I loved it. Made sense. It was rational. I was in. I was sold. We were going to make it a go. So we were off. <laughs> Middle of January, we took off. 
in the airport in, here in Cleveland, our only plans were I had a job, my kids had a school, and we had a hotel reservation for two weeks. The rest we were going to figure out there. That was our plan. So upon our arrival in Sydney, we get there early in the morning, we dropped off our bags in the hotel, and we had things to do. We had to open a bank account. We had to find a car. We had to find an apartment. We had to figure out where the kid's school was, where my hospital that I was going to be working at was. We had to figure out these things, and we had to do them together. We assembled our furniture together. The kids adjusted to uniforms to their new schools. <laughs> we explored as a family together, and what we showed the kids is that you can take your life and go somewhere else and be OK. You can establish yourself in a community and get a job and find friends and get, get involved in sports and art projects and, or classes, and it's OK and you can establish a life. We talked about there was going to be good days and there was going to be bad days, and we needed to talk about that together. We took advantage of our time there. We visited amazing places throughout Australia and the region, like the Great Barrier Reef. We went to Southeast Asia, and we tried interesting foods. <laughs> we had a lot of new experiences. <laughs> we laughed a lot together. We learned a lot together. We met people from worlds apart, but yet weren't so different from us. We offered food to the monks. We learned a lot about Buddhism. We learned how to use chopsticks the right way. We visited a lot of Buddhist temples and saw a lot of Buddhas. We had unique experiences that will be with us for a lifetime. We met fascinating people. The kids learned to surf. I learned to drive on the opposite side of the road. We witnessed some of the most spectacular views in the world. We made lifelong friends. And we brought back some great souvenirs. <laughs> and of course, we couldn't leave Australia without learning how to throw the boomerang. One of the most unexpected outcomes of this year was my job. When I signed up for it, it was just an opportunity to justify where I was going. But in fact, my job changed my life. Because there I was doing innovative research on MRI imaging of the prostate, which I never would have had the opportunity to do. And it has changed the way I practice medicine at home. It's changed my academic career, my research. It's the way I changed the way I manage my patients. It's amazing. I came back rejuvenated, excited about what I'm doing now. I never would have had this opportunity. Totally unexpected. One of my good friends in Australia said to me one day, you know, in America, y'all live to work. In Australia, we work to live. Something to think about. So after a year, just like a boomerang, we'd return back home to the same house the same job and the same school. To be perfectly honest, not much changes here. <laughs> but we were changed forever. You know, we could have bought a fancy car or vacation home or something like that, which we would never remember. New iPhone, we wouldn't have remembered that in 20, 30 years. But my kids will remember this for a lifetime. So for those of you who are sitting here, even trying to comprehend the thought of getting off the grid. Here are my thoughts. Don't ignore free advice. Find opportunities they will not find you. Be flexible, be open, be responsible, be humble. Plan as best you can, but plan for the unexpected. And always keep in mind what your priorities are. Look, I never want to look a doctor in the eye and say, I wish I would have done things differently. I never want to feel stuck. I never want to take for granted that life is short. I never want to have regret. Many people say to me, since we've been back, what a great opportunity you had. I wish I would have such an opportunity. Some of you may be thinking that now. Guess what? You do. You have a year to live. Some words that none of us ever want to hear. But if I do, 
I know that I've experienced the year I would want to live. Have you? Thank you very much. Thank you.